And uh, again, the record's open for two weeks if you wish to submit a written statement. We'll now turn to the executive, executive uh, Yeshem Yomaz, who's Director of Fiscal and Legislative Analysis, DC Officer of Revenue Analysis, Officer of the Chief Financial Officer, and Mark Chambers, Sustainability Manager, Energy and Sustainability Division, Department of General Services. Good afternoon. We're also going to have um, Lane Sidlowski from the Office of Planning and Brennan Shane from the Department of the Environment available for questions afterwards. Okay. So, Mr. Chambers, are you beginning? I am. And you are testifying on behalf of the executive? Correct. Go on. Good afternoon, Chairperson Mendelson and members of the staff of the Committee of the Whole. I am Mark Chambers, Associate Director for Energy and Sustainability, Division of the Department of General Services, or DGS. Today I'm pleased to testify on Bill 20-677, the DC Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014. The administration is a strong supporter of urban farming, as evidenced by the Mayor's Sustainable DC Plan and the policies included in Chapter 6, Environmental Protection, of the DC Comprehensive Plan. The Sustainable DC Plan already encourages urban farming and improving access to fresh and healthy foods through the following. Increasing agricultural use of land through cultivation of an additional 20 acres of land, which requires updates to the zoning code to allow for urban agriculture and greenhouses. The Department of Parks and Recreation, DPR, um, developed guidance and regulations for using public land for architecture. Uh, an Office of Planning tool that will inform the public about available agricultural plots. Installation of educational gardens at 50% of DC public schools, which is approximately 65 schools. Developing orchards and food producing landscapes on five acres of DC public space and developing pop-up agriculture sites by partnering with local organizations and individuals to promote local foods and agriculture throughout the district. The Sustainable DC Plan requires a food access and security report by January 31st, 2015, which will consider two goals. One, evaluating the existing conditions for food access, urban agriculture, and how to develop an agricultural economy in the district and two, to develop recommendations to mitigate food insecurity and increase access to healthy foods. The plan also seeks to ensure that at least 75% of the district residents live within one quarter mile of a community garden, a farmer's market, or a store selling healthy foods. Through multiple district agencies, such as the Department of the Environment, the University of the District of Columbia, and DPR, the administration is working to provide fruit trees and fruiting shrubs to homeowners that remove impervious surfaces from their yards, provide locally grown produce from a 143 acre farm in Beltsville, Maryland, and educate residents on urban farming through free classes and plans to renovate two greenhouses through a grant creating a seedling cooperative. Regarding the proposed legislation, the proposed legislation seeks to amend Title 47 of the DC Official Code with respect to tax credits for food donations and to provide a real property tax abatement under specific circumstances, as well as amend the Food Production and Urban Gardens Program of 1986. My testimony will speak primarily to amendments to the Food Production and Urban Gardens Program Act, which proposes to establish an urban farming and land leasing initiative establish non-refundable tax credit for food donations to district food banks or shelters, and establish a real property tax abatement for unimproved land lease for, prop for the purpose of allowing small-scale farming. The proposed legislation would require the district to begin an urban farming land initiative, beginning with the identification of at least 25 district-owned vacant parcels of land at least 2,500 square feet which have no pending disposition or development agreements by February 1st, 2015. Additionally, the mayor would establish a land leasing initiative through which qualified district applicants could develop vacant lots for urban agriculture over a period of three years. And the applicants must be district resident for at least one year prior to application, 
have demonstrated experience in agriculture, not being arrears to the district for more than $100 in outstanding fines, penalties, or interest, and not have any code violations on any property owned by the applicant. Regarding amendments to the Food Production and Urban Gardens Program Act of 1986, the proposed legislation leaves many questions unanswered. Number one, site locations. The bill proposes the mayor identify 25 sites that could be used as urban farming plots. The Department of General Services evaluated available unimproved parcels of the proposed size throughout the district and determined that only 16 qualify on the basis of size. However, there are additional restrictions in some cases planned uses that we must also consider applicable zoning laws and whether variances may be necessary to activate these vacant parcels as urban farms. DGS also considered the possibility of combining slivers that were too small to meet the requirements of the legislation, and again determined that such sites were not likely to be suitable given their proximity to roadways, planned use, or applicable zoning. It should also be noted that DPR currently manages 14 community garden sites and 11 community gardens that have recently been created through the Mayor's Play DC initiative, adding an additional 160 personal garden plots. <coughs> the legislation is unclear on whether these existing 25 sites would be considered separately from the land leasing initiative. It is also unclear whether the bill includes sites at which there are already planned community gardens, such as the St. Elizabeth's Greenhouse, Walker Jones, Kingman Island, Capitol Gateway, and the Bright Farms Hydroponic Greenhouse to be built in Ward 8. Number two, terminology. The legislation is unclear about who may be an applicant. The residency requirements appears to focus on individuals, but the inclusion of the farm cooperative and independent farm terms seem to indicate non-individuals may also be considered applicants. Comparable jurisdictions such as Baltimore and Boston have used both nonprofit and for-profit entities in their farming initiatives, but the legislation does not adequately address whether such entities would be successful applicants even if other qualifications are met. The bill is also silent on when and how applicants would be chosen and what process would be used. Baltimore, for example, has a lengthy application process through which financial management and community engagement plans must be provided and the applicant must pass an interview. The bill gives little guidance on how the program's participants would be granted access to district land. Further, there is a lack of distinction regarding the cost of farms versus gardens. Farms can be the subject of unique borrowing and insurance restrictions as opposed to gardens. The definition for independent farm seems to distinguish it from urban farming based on the quantity of production, but urban farming cannot be distinguished from urban agriculture. Additional clarity on the proposed legislation's terminology would be particularly useful. Number three, financial impacts. The bill is also silent on several potential financial questions and impacts. While the district does have an obvious and expressed interest in increasing the amount of urban agriculture land used throughout the district, it is unclear from the introduced, beer, <coughs> introduced bill what consideration or benefits the district receives from the applicants for the use of its land. The Baltimore program charges a nominal use fee of $100 per year and an additional $120 per year for access to water but the proposed legislation does not provide whether there would be a payment by the user in the land lease, and if so, where or how these funds would be directed or used. Additionally, it is unclear who would bear the financial and personnel responsibility for maintaining the plots, particularly in the fall and winter months when it is unlikely any fruits or vegetables can be successfully grown. Currently, DGS is in the is the district's leasing authority, as well as the agency that maintains parks and many vacant parcels throughout the district. The bill fails to clarify whether a DGS or another district agency, such as the, the Department of Transportation, would be expected to maintain these areas during off season, or whether it is solely the responsibility of the lessees. Additionally, the bill fails to consider how water or irrigation would be supplied to these parcels and how the district would handle the resultant water runoff from the properties. For the district to install water sources at each of these locations could be an estimated $12,000 per site. This does not include the cost of the water that may be used at the site. 
The bill should clarify if the individual lessees would bear the responsibility of costs associated with maintenance, water use, and water runoff. There may also be a need for additional FTEs for the implementing agencies for activities such as developing and reviewing applications and reviewing tax credit and real property abatement forms. Baltimore has several FTEs dedicated to implementing and overseeing its urban agriculture program and the district would likely need no less. Number four, property reclamation. The bill does not address how the district may reclaim any lease property if during the three year leasing term, the property is not adequately maintained if no cultivation or if no cultivation is taking place. The district may eventually need to reactivate these parcels as part of future planned redevelopment. The community is not likely going to weather well the removal of this agricultural land for development purposes. It is unclear whether the proposed legislation intends for urban farming sites to be long-term community commitments or interim uses for members <coughs> for currently unused property, excuse me. As the leasing terms are set at three years apiece, community members may well grow very attached to their plots and such that the endeavor expected to be short-term uh, revitalization of vacant property becomes a long-term impediment to additional development and revenue. Number five, environmental concerns. There may be an environmental issue inherent in some of these vacant partials, which may require environmental review or abatement prior to using the land to grow food. The bill does not address this possibility nor provide any guidance on whether the district would be responsible for the cost and any abatement if necessary. The urban agricultural program in Baltimore, for instance, plays any, pay, places any necessary environmental re remediation on the farmers. Additionally, the proposed legislation is silent on how lessees may or may not handle any issues related to rodents. As the land would only be leased from the district, it should be clarified whether the Department of Health or DGS would continue to be responsible for rat abatement or for construction of additional structures such as fencing to mitigate rodents gaining access to the property or consuming the food commodities grown there. It may be of particular, particularly useful to require that any parcels identified for urban agricultural purposes are made rodent proof or that a plan for rodent control be submitted for review by the Department of Health by, by applicants to ensure that food commodities are not attracting rodents. Department of Health should also be considered as an authority to inspect urban agriculturally produced commodities to ensure their safety prior to entering the food chain for human consumption. The bill does not address whether sustainable practices would be encouraged or even mandated as they do in Baltimore. In such ways as requiring the use of organic materials and prohibiting using particular chemical herbicides or fungicides. The district in remaining the owner of these parcels and indirectly managing the effects of the runoff from these parcels has a very vested interest in maintaining the integrity of the land as well as ensuring that only healthy produce is grown, particularly if some of that produce is donated to shelters and food banks. The proposed legislation is also silent on the issue of waste, waste management and waste removal. Clarity is necessary to ensure that the lessees are to be responsible for maintaining the cleanliness of the plots and removing all garbage and associated waste, or whether the district would still be expected to maintain these areas. Number six, community engagement. As with all projects in the district, community notice and dis discussion is paramount, but the, the proposed legislation does not address community engagement. Although the district seeks to increase the acreage of urban agriculture throughout the city, we cannot do so at the expense of our residents. As Baltimore requires from its applicants, the district should require from its applicants a plan on how the community will be engaged on transforming any vacant parcels into urban farms. Some residents may want to grow non-edibles such as herbs or flowers, and some residents may be interested in growing medical marijuana in accordance with our laws. It should be an open discussion with the community regarding whether an urban farm and the items grown on that farm are wanted in that neighborhood. Number seven. Finally, the administration suggests that the legislation be amended to ensure that the mayor has rulemaking authority for the implementation of urban farming. As mentioned already, the district is already very involved in creating and supporting urban farming in the district. And as the intention of the legislation dovetails well with current 
with work currently underway, it would be advantageous for all such similar programs and initiatives to be guided through a global vision for increasing healthy food <coughs> availability and access. That concludes my testimony today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the administration's view on the DC Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014. In sum, while we agree with the goal of increasing both the availability of fresh food, fruits and vegetables and the productive use of district property. We believe that the bill can be strengthened by addressing the concerns I discussed in my testimony and by clarifying language related to applicants and farming, clarifying personnel, cost implications and the environmental concerns, as well as delineate, delineating these proposals from the sustainable DC plan. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Ms. Uh, Yomas. Good afternoon, Chairman Mandelson, Councilman Grosso. My name is Yashim Yomas, um, and I'm pleased to testify for the uh, Office of the Chief Financial Officer on Bill 2677. I'll keep my comments really brief and focus mostly on the tax incentives uh, that are uh, proposed by the legislation. I submitted my full testimony for your review, but I'll just stick to just some brief points on there. Um, there are two types of tax credits. The legislation offers income tax credits and real property tax abatements. On the income tax credits, um, the, the section that provide, uh, proposes these credits is titled Farm to Food. However, uh, the way it's drafted, the credit is available to anyone, whether they've produced the food or they've just taken out some food from their refrigerator and donated to a um, shelter um, or, a, or, or, a, or, a, or another eligible nonprofit entity. I think that this needs to be, um, this intent needs to be clarified because if this is indeed the intent that anyone who donates any, any food, whether they've grown it or purchased it, would be eligible for a tax credit, the fiscal implications could be <laughs> very big. Just to give you an example, the non-refundable tax credit offered by the bill is worth much more to individuals than the charitable donate, donations deductions that they can take under our current law. Our current law allows uh, individuals, as well as uh, business entities, corporations, and unincorporated businesses to um, deduct up to 15% of their gross income as charitable contributions. Given our marginal tax rates, each dollar deducted will yield about nine cents, nine cents in income benefits. That's our current law. This legislation will allow a full dollar for each dollar, um, e each dollar um, of charitable contribution eligible under this legislation. To just on the income tax side, we have about three hundred thousand uh, dollar, three hundred thousand taxpayers, and our current tax data shows them shows us that a third of these individuals or tax filers do claim some sort of charitable. A donation. If each of them claimed 150 bucks a year, 150 dollars, the cost of this legislation just on the income side would be 13 million dollars. So that clarification is very important for us before we can score this legislation. I have some more data there. This is also true for the corporate side. Uh, I think the numbers will only be relevant if that's the intent. So I want to wait to hear from the drafters before we could continue to score this legislation. The property tax credits, our comments here, is, um, and I'm reflecting the comments of our tax council here, mostly about the administration of the property tax credits. As drafted, the benefit would be available to both individuals and entities. That's a 50% reduction in the tax bill, essentially. Um, and I think we want to clarify that if it's just individuals or both individuals and entities that will benefit from this uh, tax reduction. Um, from an administrative perspective as well, the benefit could be burdensome to administer. Every, every abatement, we are assuming that there will be an application through the life of the lease, whatever it is, three years, five years. And every application, OTR will have to go out and verify if it's the full, full land or a portion of the land that's being used for farming purposes. Um, we would like to suggest some similar, some simpler alternatives that might 
get the counsel to the intended outcome. For example, the reduction of the SS value by a specified amount like the homestead deduction may get us there with much less administrative burden, although it won't be as targeted as what is under the legislation or to allow the reduction in tax on the entire property by a certain percentage for it could be if more than x percent of your land is leased for this purposes you could get this much of a reduction could be something like that but we're looking forward to working with the drafters again on the, on the language um other items related to the fiscal impact analysis, disposing or leasing district property to be used for farming purposes would not have a fiscal impact. Our assets are not a part of our budget and financial plan. However, I think as Mr. Chambers noted, we, the, the, the agreement between the district and the lessee should be very specific on who bears the burden of what. Um, just to give you another example, if we were to identify all 25 plots and were required to bring the necessary irrigation infrastructure, that would be another half a million dollars that would have to be budgeted for this particular legislation. I have a bunch of technical corrections, which I will not go through. <laughs> um, and that's the end of my testimony. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, Ms. Yilmaz, what is... Uh, the um, a non-refundable income tax credit mm -hmm. means a credit against the tax liability. If the credit exceeds the liability, there's no payment by the district yes. government. Yes. Uh, so, um, if the non-refundable credit is up to twenty-five hundred dollars and uh, one's uh, tax liability is a thousand dollars, that's all they would get is a thousand dollars. I'm understanding that yes. correctly. The, um, let me ask you this. Uh, there seem to be two intents with this bill. One is uh, farming, and farming would be a, on a fairly large piece of land. When I say fairly large, I think the bill says 5,000 square feet. That would be over an acre. There is probably not a lot of opportunity that, for that in the district. If we were to uh, provide a, uh, let's say, a different tax class, I know you guys hate additional tax classes, but a uh, farming category of, um, let's say, um, half the residential real property mm -hmm. tax rate, so 45 cents. Yes. Because there are probably not a lot of parcels, what, what kind of fiscal impact would we be looking at? That's a very good question. And what you're suggesting is like zoning the land as agricultural or, or, or reclassifying as, as farming with a lower rate. Um, right now, vacant land in the district that's not, um, that doesn't have any improvement on it is, 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 it's, is either classified class one or class two. We don't include those in class three anymore. So they're either considered residential proper, you, for residential use or commercial use, even if there is nothing on it. Uh, we would look at the difference between what the rate would be depending on the native class this land is in right now. I think uh, I, I, before answering the question, I would like to take a look at, you know, the fiscal impact is a matter of magnitude. If we have sufficiently high number of lots that will meet the requirements such that the cost difference is worth, you know, scoring. If we're just talking about one or two lots, probably in the bigger scheme of things, the fiscal impact will be minimal. But if we're talking about... Um, well, the number of lots is going to be limited by, first of all, it has to be over an acre. 5,000 square feet, I 2, believe, 2,500, that's what's in the bill. Hmm? 2,500, yeah. all right, I got my math wrong. So we're talking about over half an acre. Yes. Still, that limits the number of parcels. And second of all... Yeah, I would have to um, look. There are other issues involved. Uh, chances are that... If there were to be a half an acre that's available downtown, it's probably going to be built as a commercial office building, not set aside for farming. And uh, so that would be limiting as well. I would think it's probably a small number of parcels. I would think so too, but I just don't know. So I'd like to go and look before I commit to any kind of number. Okay. Um, the other side of this, or the other piece of this is that for some folks, they see this as an opportunity to put, um, I'm going to say blighted land, and I use that term mm -hmm. loosely, blighted land into use. Use as a, uh, um, <clears throat> maybe not a farm, because it's probably smaller, a garden. 
If it is vacant land, it's taxed at five dollars a square foot. Not I mean, square this, five dollars a, a hundred dollar valuation. No, I I, I believe uh, we have. Um, if it's vacant and unimproved, we don't have any buildings on it. And it's, if it's not blighted, which means you know it's properly mowed, doesn't have trash on it, then it's taxed at its native class, either, either as residential or commercial. Then we have um, vacant and improved properties that are taxed at $5. So if you have an empty building with um, nobody is living in it, so it is taxed at $5, and then we have the blighted category, which will be taxed at $10 per $100 of value. Does assessment. blighted have to be improved? No. Uh, I believe so. I can't remember from the top of my head, but most likely. OK. I think I've taken that as about as far as I can with you. Uh, Mr. Chambers, I shouldn't start off this way, but I, um, I, I want to say I think you had fun writing this testimony. When you talk about how community notice a plan and how the community will be engaged, I, I think that's, how do I put it, uh, getting trending toward hyperbole and then growing medical marijuana on the, um, the plot. I just don't see that as, um, I don't see that from this bill. It would have been helpful if rather than talking about what was wrong with the bill, the executive actually had suggestions for what the bill should look like. I appreciate that you make the point, and you make the point uh, again, that the administration has a commitment toward uh, a sustainable district, and sustainability includes um, urban agriculture. But having made that point, basically you just leave it to us on how we're going to draft the bill. That's the way I, I read your testimony. Um, instead of suggesting terminology, you tell us what's wrong with terminology. And um, I don't know, I'm kind of glancing through your, your testimony. Uh, property reclamation bill does not address how the district may reclaim any leased property. Presumably, that would be in the lease. Um, and uh, you talk about environmental concerns, but uh, rather than say that they're concerns, you could have um, articulated how the bill would be improved, what the provision should be in the bill. And um, so in those ways, it's not really very helpful. All it does is tell us what we ought to look at, and then it's up to us to figure out what we want to do. Why would there be a, ne uh, a, a necessity for uh, updating the zoning code? First of all, I'd like to say that we are very committed to working with you to develop this bill. And so I think that our goal is to be helpful. And one of those ways is by kind of pointing out the, the noticeable issues that we think we can work together on to help to develop. Um, as yeah, far as stating the problem without a solution, but go on. As far as your, um, I think we actually, I'm going to ask you to repeat your question about the zoning. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'm misreading this, but you seem to, on page one, suggest that we're going to have to update the zoning code to allow urban agriculture. Hmm? Sure, you can jump in. Um, so I'm Lane Sathowski with the DC Office of Planning, and I worked on the, the zoning code revisions. Currently in the code right now, truck farming is the defined allowed agricultural use in every zone. So whether it's an R1 or a, industrial zone land and truck gardening refers to uh, a garden of the scale that you could take the produce and truck it to another location. So it's sort of a historic terminology, but it is acknowledged in the code, but it's not explicit that today's modern agriculture or greenhouses could be used. So it's allowed, but it's not, um, it's not an explicit provision or a zone type or a sort of entire section of itself. And where is it allowed? It's allowed in all zones. All right, well, if it's allowed in all zones, then why do we have to update the zoning code? 
A lot of other jurisdictions have more explicit provisions included in the law. The way our zoning code works is that if something is not explicitly stated as permitted and say a greenhouse is not stated as permitted in our current zoning code, then that means um, it's not allowed. So if you are not calling well, not your- not necessarily. The zoning administrator looks at uh, what the proposed use is and tries to figure out if it's, uh, there's something in the zoning regulations that would address that. So I'm not quite, if, if truck farming is explicitly acknowledged in the zoning regulations and permitted in every zone, what part of urban agriculture would not be permitted under our zoning regulations? We're not talking about livestock here, we're talking about farming. Yeah, I'm not sure what the, the exact reference there is to what part is not allowed, but in well, the current- I'm not sure zone. what problem there is. Let me go on. DGS ident identified only 16 parcels. Uh, what was your evaluation criteria? So the there are only 16 pieces of land in the district that are over 2,500 square feet? So we, we did a, a, a quick analysis to see which, um, which sites that did not have any particular um, intended uh, use that were in the neighborhood of 2,500 and above square feet that could be dedicated towards this. And that Query came back with about 16 properties. Remember, what was the first part of it? So we, we did, we the looked at The query said parcels that did not already have an intended use. Right, part of the legislation um, asked for um, properties that were not uh, planned for development. And they also asked for us to deliver a, um, a vacant property report in January that's kind of explained which properties were, um, would be applicable to this and did not have planned use. Well, but the planned use is a pretty big if. There are a lot of properties that have a planned use that have had a planned use for, I don't know, maybe decades, and nothing's happened. Correct. Okay, so how, how many properties came up with the query that are over 2,500 square feet? I would have to go back and check that, and I can have that answer for can you. Can you give me week. a guess? I don't, I don't have that information. 32, 132, 1,032? I do not have that information in front of me. But I can get it to you by the end of business next Friday. Uh, why, are in, why are there insurance restrictions that are different for, why is insurance even an issue here? Well, in the terminology section, we were referring to the fact that different um, classifications and different terminologies often do come with, um, with various kind of financial uh, uh, regulations, and so we wanted to call our attention to that to verify that it may but be an issue. What's the issue? The issue is being. Do I have to get different insurance if I have a, a garden in my backyard? Because of the the difference between whether or not it is a individual person or an entity, and us asking for clarification on that, we are asking whether or not there would be um, additional considerations, and that could be addressed with more clear terminology. But that goes to the entity, not to our part in this. Under the bill, our part in this is that you identify 25 parcels, you make them available in a three-year lease, you can negotiate what the terms are on the lease. The bill is actually rather vague, leaving to you a whole lot of room with regard to the lease. Be that as it may, if you end up leasing it to an individual who's um, an individual, uh, whatever insurance is necessary is, is up to that individual. I don't, I don't get where that's an issue. And if it's a company, then the insurance would be whatever the company requires. And if it's a nonprofit, the insurance would be, all that's on the individual. I don't even under, I don't understand why that's relevant. So what it speaks to is our kind of commitment to the success of the program. So we want to make sure that these, these leases are successful. And so by addressing issues in the beginning, whether it's through the actual legislation or just through our kind of working together, we feel that it might yield a better and more um, lasting result. How much experience do you have with urban gardening or farming? Uh, personally, professionally? Yeah. Yes. With, um, I, I have an urban garden at, at my home and um, uh, within the, my capacity at the Department of General Services, we also um, manage the, um, our urban agricultural efforts. And other than you're presumably not growing medical marijuana, has there been any community issue with your garden plot or your experience with DGS? 
I am. Not with, no, not, not particularly, but that, part of that okay. has to do with engaging the community. Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Um, yes, thank you. I guess I'm a little bit confused. I mean, I think to start with, I just want to note that I did raise the concern around, like in my thought process, around individuals donating food for a tax break. And it occurred to me that it would probably cost them more to buy the vegetables to donate than it would to actually get the break. You know, so I didn't address the, whether or not it was an individual or actually a farm for that reason. I, I thought it would be highly unusual for somebody to try to make any money that way, and so therefore they wouldn't game the system in that way at all. Uh, in fact, because I can't imagine how you could do that. Now, maybe they could steal vegetables somewhere and donate them for some profit or maybe dumpster dive for them, but I don't, I don't, I just don't see that as a real legitimate discussion. And you can answer that, but it seems weird. Uh, I, well, that's, I think, a really good point. Uh, the point I was trying to make is even with a small donation, say you have your Thanksgiving dinner, you find these produce in your refrigerator, you just take it to a shelter, write off $150 from your taxes, even with a small, tiny amount, the fiscal implication could be big. If it wasn't 150, but if it was $50, the cost would be somewhere around $4 million. It's still a fiscal impact. How could you possibly make that assessment? Like, how would you know? Most people aren't even going to know that this exists. Most people are going to be, I mean, this is intended for active farmers who are trying to do good and know about it, not for my leftovers from Thanksgiving. And if the, if the legislation clarified that, that would be a very okay. simple solution. That's all we're saying. I think this is what we understood it to be, that from okay. production to donation, then the fiscal impact will be very different. Okay, I, I, thank you. I appreciate that. We can definitely look at that and making that change. It's just I, I, I think you make a lot of good recommendations, and we should look at them. And, and the CFO's office also worked with us in drafting this and was very helpful, and hopefully we can get it right and continue to move it forward. Um, Mr. Chambers, I, I, you know, one of the comments you made in your testimony was that you wanted to protect the integrity of the land. And, um, you know, that's really the fundamental kind of key here for me in part of this legislation is that, that we're not doing that now that it's abandoned, that it's, uh, it's in our community and people have to walk by it every single day and see these chain link fence around it. Um, and you know, you're doing a fairly good job, I think, cleaning it, but that's from administration to administration, not necessarily good or bad. And um, my point is that I want to activate it. Um, and one of the things that frustrates me about your testimony, and the only, I think, really positive section in your testimony is that we should give you the authority to do regulations explicitly. We've just left that out, and I wouldn't mind doing that. Um, but the fact of the matter is when you sit down to make an agreement here for the property that's available, you would be able to write into that, you're responsible for the water, you're responsible for this, you're, whatever the people are willing to negotiate. And for you to say that that should be written into the legislation to me is a completely disingenuous approach to this testimony. The fact of the matter is that this legislation gives you the framework. Now, I'm not the kind of person that's going to write legislation that's going to tell the executive branch exactly how to implement every single aspect of every single policy. That's the point here. The point is that the executive has the ability to look out there, to talk to people, and to engage. So, for example, your comment on rodents is completely ill-informed. You do not have any idea how a garden works if you think that rodents are going to be a huge problem in the garden process. People that maintain gardens, I have a garden and a compost pile on my property, and I've never had a single rodent because of the way I maintain it. Now, if you want to put up all these restrictions around this law and say that this law should not be passed until we have some provision in there that says people have to have a rodent barrier around their garden, that just shows to me like there's something else going on here. What are you doing? Are you, are you telling me, is, is this legislation in like set up, I mean, is your testimony on this legislation established entirely to try to defeat this legislation because you believe that the DC sustainability plan, which is nothing but a plan, is actually going to actually do enough and so that we don't need this? Or are you really trying to move this ball forward? Now, 16 sites to me is a lot of sites. Mm -hmm. That's a great first effort. And to your own admission, you said that you've only just taken a quick look at it, right? Yep. I believe by next year you could have 25 sites that you could identify quite easily. I can name six or eight of them in my neighborhood alone that I think could be used for this purpose. That are DC properties. So, um, you know, what's your point, man? So, Why would you do this? What, what's your point with your testimony that you would come in here with this kind of kind of 
a, you know, almost attack on this law rather than trying to figure out what the main intent is and work with us on it. So I think to start off, the, um, the idea that my intent or our intent is to be um, somewhat disingenuous or to not be helpful. You know what I want to do? What I want to do is just cut the government out of it. That's why after hearing your testimony, I would rather not have you involved at all and just do a private sector, you know, bill that gives tax incentives and work with the CFO to make that happen. What I was trying to do here is be a good player in the community so that DGS and the government could be seen as a positive part of the neighborhood and do these kinds of things that actually produce food. So it's really frustrating. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut so, you off. Um, but you, you frustrated me. Uh, understandably. I mean, I, but I think that for us to ensure the success of this, we have to ask what we would determine to be difficult questions in the beginning. And yes, some of those may end up in legislation. Some of those may end up in rulemaking on the executive side. But our goal and my goal is actually to see the success of this program and a, uh, a significant growth in urban agriculture throughout the city. I mean, the, the comment on rodents is not... Um, it's not ill-advised. I mean, there, we have, let me give you an example. We have a, a very strong and growing um, uh, organics program that we've, that we've rolled out in the schools and are increasing presently with the, um, the, um, the DPR But that program sites. didn't increase the number of rodents but, in that let, neighborhood. Uh, please allow me to finish. So one of, the, one of the, the tenets of that was that we developed on-site composting in addition to larger hauling practices from these sites. We had to go through extensive kind of design to make sure that we were looking at a compost, on-site composting um, um, container that would mitigate any rodent issues whatsoever so that the success of all the other pro projects that we are doing on the back of that can continue. We, we had a Department of Health come out to make sure that they gave us the stamp of approval. But you understand that composting and rodent-proof composting is an education issue. It is not about the container. It is about what you put in to the compost, and that's the deal, right? I mean, now, I can understand that there are unintended consequences that could happen because somebody throws some cheese in there that they shouldn't have thrown in there. Um, but the fact of the matter is it's properly managed and it's properly operating. And, you know, if you do that, then you can't even use that compost anymore. You know, like, it wouldn't even be useful for these farmers to do that and have rodents around. They know how to mitigate this. That's why there's a rule in here that says you have to have experience with farming for at least a year because you wouldn't just be some willy-nilly person in there who doesn't know what they're doing on how to manage the property. That would be exactly what we would want to see happen. It's in there. So, so That's in the bill. Did you read the bill? I, I did read the bill. Are you um, sure? The other thing in the bill is that we asked for more clarity on how those people would be su suggest would be selected and what is the... But do you um, really the, want me to the, put that in the, in the law? That seems like a regulatory framework thing. It's like you should be able to say, here's the system we're going to go through to select the people. Here's the land, how we're going to select the land, we're going to do this. All I wanted to do was say, look, you have to go do this. We need to start getting some of these vacant properties activated, and this is when you're going to do it by. How you do that from here, you really want me involved in that? You really want me saying that it's going to be an online form that can be submitted, you know, uh, only on the third Tuesday of the month and that there's going to only be 100 people allowed? You really want the legislation to say that? Have you seen our code? Our code is already a mess. We don't want that stuff in code. We want that in regulations. We're, again, we're committed to, to the success of this, and this is an iteration like of that. All right. Well, I, you know, again, I think that as you, as you move forward with this, those considerations are really important. And, and I think you need to keep in mind that there are business decisions that are made every single day when these property, you know, when these farmers are trying to operate a business. And that's the kind of conversation you should have with them when you lease with them is um, how are you going to do insurance, how are you going to do water production, how are you going to manage your property, all of that are relevant questions to ask once we've gotten to the point where we already have a list of properties and you already have qualified people and you're entering into the agreement for however long it's going to be. Now, you're concerned about, and I think it's a valid concern about, you know, obligating these lands for a long period of time when you might want to have some other economic purpose there. And I think you should put that into the consideration when you're looking at the properties that you're going to put out there, right? It shouldn't just be a mandate that every property, no, you have to think about location, think about future planning. Uh, that's why the Office of Planning is so important, so that we can use them to help us understand the kind of what's best in our city, right? I mean, but there's some land all over the place that I don't think is necessarily going to be, you know, ever developed, right? For example, Irving Street Bypass 
along the hospitals, right, where the big clover leaf is that goes on North Capitol Street, which is a ridiculous design for an urban street structure, but whatever. You have all that land in that clover leaf, right? Who owns that? Who operates it? Who manages it? Why couldn't that be an urban farm right there? You know, water problems, right? Oh, yeah, it's, you need water to grow vegetables. Of course you do. But is that really our problem, or is that the farmer's problem? I think that's the farmer's problem. We shouldn't have to produce water for them. They're going to find the water that they need in order to do it. All they want is a place to put the vegetables in the ground and grow them and be able to sell them. That's what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. I'm not sure you want all that that you mentioned as examples in the regulations either. Some, some of that was, you don't have to respond. Uh, I don't have any other questions for you all. Um, if you, uh, either of you want to supplement your testimony at all, that would be helpful. And the record's open for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to try to work through this. The bill was uh, sequentially referred. So um, the uh, committee as a whole doesn't actually get the bill until after Finance and Revenue has worked on it. Um, I do think... Um, Ms. Yilmaz, that uh, in my questions, there were po possibly some directions we could go that would um, be a little bit easier in terms of um, tax incentives. Okay. So we might follow up with you on that. Thank, thank you, all of you, for your testimony. Thanks. Uh, this uh, concludes the hearing on this bill.